And then here, we go to minor, B flat. Now, I didn't copy and paste the data exactly. It's moved around and edited slightly differently. But I think it's really cool to point out that the same way you can use suspensions as a standalone chord, it doesn't have to be like a, a suspension and then resolve to the major third crammed into one bar if you're doing like a chord every bar. I can even do, I'll do five bars for a phrase instead of four if that suspension's in there to let it hold out a little more and really hammer home the point that yes, it's suspending and there's the major. We're in G major. You got that? We're in G major. And then immediately we just switch to G minor. And it's a key change, technically speaking, but it's I think of it more as a modal change than anything else. But the point is you feel like as a listener, you're moving forward. It feels like we've gone somewhere else, even if we haven't changed the basis of the note. We're still in G. It's just from from major to minor. Now it helps that we're changing so many of these instruments around as well. And we're adding the flute. And all this is doing is going back and forth between G minor and E flat major with G in the bass. So you hear this raised the flat six the whole entire time. That's, that's the whole section is just vacillating between those two chords. I think if I do the acoustic, you can really hear it. probably the most tried and true sort of minor progression to make it feel like things are moving forward, but it, to it totally works. I'm, I'm not ashamed to do something that works. It's like every instrument is just riffing on that. And then the chord, the G minor is only being rung every other bar. So it's not going from, from G minor to E flat, from G minor to E flat. It's like halftime on this and those other instruments we were looking at in the previous video every two bars because it would get repetitive really quickly if all these things were hitting every single bar and everything else was playing and these guys were all going and it's like break it up, thin it out, and stretch it. And I promise you a lot of times I did whatever the halfway point is, I would do this and then think, well, I could double that. And then I'd just copy and paste and change stuff around on the second half of the phrase. And then I'd play live stuff to go over all of that once I had an idea of what it was going to sound like. And it makes it feel like it's building that way too. Same thing goes with the strings. I bring in the same staccato sort of single note pulsing strings that we had in the major section two sections before but it's on the eight bar back end of this phrase so at first the strings and then when we get to the second half of the eight bars it might be now it's a little busier it's not copy and pasted Up a fifth, make it feel like it's building. Octaves. This is basically trailer music 101 as well. If you have a 16 bar phrase, you're gonna do it like this. So you get this, I can't draw a line. <laughs> you get this arc that goes like that, as far as pitches are concerned, but that also helps as far as intensity of the music is concerned. So in addition to the strings building that way, if I'm correct, I believe the percussion also gets a little bit busier 
the same way. See, <laughs> I totally nailed it. I played something here and then I did play it busier. This was just one live pass I did, but all of these guys that are in white, I muted. So that's actually what it looks like, the final version, except you can see I have those muted, so they're not playing. So I played it simple and then more complicated, but then I went back and thinned it out even more so that there was more of a contrast between the two sections. I think the live stuff just kind of goes on. The djembe, you know, we looked at the way this builds, but now that I've said that, I just want to play this again. We're going to take a look at the strings. There's not much of a change other than the strings building here and the drums getting busier. And then another contrast. So we just have these tremolo strings going on. Back in G major. Now, because I wanted it to feel like the G major was a surprise again, that's why we've got this E flat major seven chord in the strings. And honestly, I don't think there's much pitch wise live going on there. Cause I was like, I thought E flat major seven was a cool chord to have as an anticipation before it hit the G. So if we solo all the strings, you can hear how the harmony works. Because with E flat, you have a B flat in there. So we've been going from G minor to E flat, from G minor to E flat. So I hit that E flat major seven. It really brings home the fact that we're in E flat and you should be used to that B flat. So automatically you're gonna be thinking we're going back to G minor when you hear that big E flat major seven. But instead it goes to G major. So it does the bomb. Which again, is all about the palate cleanser. And here we are, all the way back to where we were at the end of our first video. I think the last thing probably worth mentioning is just the way that these chords work. Oh, look, I even have it labeled as a B-flat 6-9. So from G to B-flat to C, G to B-flat to C. In the key of G, B-flat is not a normal chord. It should be B minor instead. It's the third, so it should be the minor third. But instead, I've got the flat in there, which again, since it's major, gives it that kind of heroic feeling, but also adventurous because it's outside of the key. Um, and kind of, to me, <laughs> when I hear stuff like that, I sort of go, oh, okay, because it's, it's unexpected. And I love the idea of doing that with major chords. Um, it's kind of a parallel major, so everything's major. G is major, B flat is major, and C is major. And you start throwing in some suspensions and some chord tones that maybe aren't necessarily part of that particular chord. Like a G or a B flat 6-9 having the, the sustained holdover. Here. This is the six, because if you're in B flat, this is the sixth note of your scale. B flat, C, D, E flat, F, G is number six. And C is gonna be your nine. This doesn't resolve until we get to here. It goes to the major third on the G.
still waiting. There it is, now we hit the G. And there's also a C suspension here. You've got the root, the fifth, the fifth, the root, and the only thing you notice there's in the middle, F, and eventually it resolves to the major third there. And it also makes a nice bum, 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 a nice downward line with the cellos. So if I took out the violins, let's just listen to this. Bum, bum, bum. It's just a fun sort of pushing forward the music kind of thing. And really, it's just the same chords over and over and over again, here and then here, it just builds up more. Now speaking of suspensions, there's a wonderful thing at the very end that I think I can show you with the MIDI. The C. That desperately wants to go, can you hear it? I mean, it wants to do this. It wants to resolve, and I'm going through chords here at the end, and at the very, very, very end, it finally resolves to the third and the fifth and the oboe. So here comes the G, but it's unresolved, it's a suspension. And very last, but not necessarily least, I was doing a lot at the beginning when I'm in the major key with kind of messing around with augmented intervals, which just means a raised fifth. So you can hear in the strings, I hint at that at the very, very end, right here with the E flat. Because basically the whole piece goes from G minor to E flat major, from G minor to E flat major. So I like the idea of going from G major to E flat. That augmented thing sort of gives it a little bit of a lift. I really, really, really loved going over the song because I'd forgotten how much fun I had working on it. Hopefully you had fun too.